please allow me to introduce our next guest speaker, Professor Miriam Zukas. <laughs> professor Miriam Zukas is a professor of adult education, and she's also the executive dean of the School of Social Science, History, and Philosophy at Birkbeck, University of London. Uh, Birkbeck is a unique specialist adult university which offers all its programs in the evening. Very interesting. Miriam was previously at the University of Leeds for 29 years, where she was professor of adult education and director of lifelong learning. Her research interests include pedagogic identities in higher education with Janice Malcolm, professional learning in the workplace, including doctors and other health care workers, and most recently, the working lives of social scientists in higher education, again with Janice Markle. She has done a stream of work which interrogates the underpinning assumptions of research about pedagogies in higher education. She was last in Cape Town in 2007 to attend the research work and learning conference hosted by UWC and ECT, and she'll be coming back later in the program to make observations about the issues here at UWC and how they've been taken up in UK and elsewhere. So let's give a hand welcome to Well, first of all, I'd rather not speak with this thing in my hand, but I suspect if I put, if I put it down, you won't yeah, be able to hear me. No, okay, I've got, to, I've got to speak with it. Um, second, I want to say thank you so much for inviting me. I feel really honored to be here and a bit embarrassed because I don't know what I have to teach you. So what I'm going to do today is just talk quite, um, perhaps to situate where I come from historically, in terms of my institution, um, to talk a little bit politically um, and about my institution, and also to talk quite personally about the problems that I encounter in my work as I see it which I think will resonate with some of the problems that you might encounter. I've asked Shirley to move the clock there, so I can see it, since I'm the one who needs to know what the time is. And I guess I have about, where's Rita, 20, 25 minutes, yeah? 20 minutes. No, I'm supposed to finish at um, 25 to 11. I'll try to go for it. Okay, so very quickly. What I'm going to do is talk about the four fathers of our two institutions. Then I'm going to tell you a bit about Birkbeck. Then I'm going to give you three stories, and then I'm going to talk about flexibility. So that's my, my plan. Uh, but I should say that this comes from this morning's newspaper, <laughs> The Guardian. You may know or not, you may not care that we have an election in the UK today. I have put my vote in before I came. Um, and the person on the left is planning to cut student fees by, no, on your, on your left. Uh, is planning to cut student fees by a third um, in, uh, if he gets elected, and the person on the right is not. So the future of the university's um, funding for undergraduates is kind of in the balance. And that's just one tiny aspect of political influence on university life, just one small aspect of it. Um, whatever happens, we know that things will change, because things always change in universities. Um, that is the st that's the state we're in. But I think that's why it's really important to go back to where we came from. And I want to say something about this man on, our, on, on my right, on my left, your right, George Birkbeck, who gave his name to my institution. Now the story goes about my institution, that he used to teach classes in the evening to technicians, he was a scientist, and the technicians really, really liked it, and he was asked to help set up Birkbeck, um, the, an institution, with some other people, one of whom was this guy, Hodgkin. And he was asked to, to set this up. They put an ad in the Times newspaper to say, anybody interested in setting up a, a college for working men, come, come to a meeting in the Crown and Anchor on the Strand, and 2,000 people turned up. And that was the start of the institution. This is in 1823. So we're going to celebrate our 200th birthday in 2023. Now, of course, there are many motives for setting up an institution. And one is, well, we just need to educate the workers to work more effectively and more efficiently. But I really like the other explanation behind Birkbeck, 
which is this quote from Hodgkin, which I'll read very quickly to you. So he says, as the laborers acquire knowledge, the foundations uh, of the social edifice will be dug up from the deep beds into which they were laid in times past. They will be curiously handled and closely examined, and they will not be restored until they were originally laid in justice, and unless justice commands their preservation. So that's something about the politics of the organization, you know, deeply embedded in the organization is the idea of knowledge as critical, you know, as a critical engagement of knowledge and workers and people who, um, for whom they are the recipients of that knowledge, they have the right to question the edifices of knowledge. Okay, this wasn't well received. Um, so, I like this quote very, very much. Um, this is 1825, two years later. Somebody says in St. James Chronicle, a scheme more completely adapted for the destruction of this empire could not have been invented by the author of evil himself, i.e. the devil, um, than that which the depraved ambition of some men, the vanity of others, and the supineness of a third, and more important class, has so nearly perfected. So, you know, don't make, I think, Sometimes, if we work in universities, I, I don't want to go back to the, the um, slide of the, the kind of politics of higher education uh, and the politics of the UK at the moment. But if you work in the universities, you can tend to think that everybody else thinks like you. And we should not forget that there is resistance. There is always resistance to some of what we want to achieve. I want to just show you another slide uh, of a forefather from Birkbeck. Um, who's a historian that some of you may have heard of, Eric Hobsbawm, he died two years ago. And he was our president at the age of, until the age of 95 when he died. Um, so he, I like this image because this image, by the way, this painting sits in our council room opposite the image of George that I showed you just now. And the kind of clash between them of the, the, the modern, the contemporary, the brash, the loud, and the very staid kind of, you know, historical image is one which reminds us about Birkbeck. So when we have something to do and we have a big decision to make, sometimes we ask our question, ourselves the question, what would George do? And sometimes we ask ourselves the question, what would Eric do? Um, okay. So of course you have your own forefathers. And the one I really liked that Shirley introduced me to is Jake's Harewell. Sure, I didn't pronounce that right. But, um, and I really love this quotation from him, which I think is worth speaking again about why are we doing this stuff? What is this all about? So he says, universities and education generally reproduce the social order, but it can alternatively educate towards it for a changed society. And I cannot, in conscience, in truth, educate or lead education towards the reproduction and maintenance of a social order which is, sorry, I can't read, uh, um, undemocratic, discriminatory, exploitative, and repressive, and stands universally recognized as such. So this is UWC's DNA, DNA, it's your blood. It's why we're having this conversation about flexible learning. Let's make no bones about it. I think it's really important to put this in the room. And I want to show you another, not yet forefather, but um, a, a quote from somebody who was a student at UWC, and I want you to guess who this was. So he says, I came to study with no financial support and I worked at the Newlands Hotel as it was then known. I worked there on the night shift as a switchboard operator in order to pay my fees. Bad photo, I think it's ridiculous, isn't it? It's great, we'll get them. So he says in a recent article published a couple of weeks ago, this is the story of most of our students because we're committed to providing access to the most socially disadvantaged, and each one of them has a story of overcoming incredible adversity in order to be here. Now, I think Tyrone's story is terrible, and I think it, it begs questions about what UWC was doing to help Tyrone in his life and his studies. That's why I think this is a really important story. It's not because, it's not because of who he is, but I hope he remembers this story when we have the flexible learning discussion. And if he were here today, I would be reminding him. Um, okay, so, moving on. Let me say something about Birkbeck, about this institution. This is the start of people's journeys to Birkbeck. So, we have, so you have an open day on Saturday. We have many open evenings, because
because we are London's Evening University. That's how we brand ourselves. All our teaching is in the evening. Has been since 1823. And our um, open evenings, where students and staff meet each other and talk and so on and so forth, are kind of the beginnings of the journey, but actually usually the journey has started sometime before that. Usually the journey has started with somebody making an inquiry or hearing about back from somebody or whatever. So we reckon it takes about three years between somebody first thinking of coming to university to actually arriving at university. Um, and this is where we want to end up, or well, our students want to end up anyway. Um, so here are some of our students graduating. I particularly like this photo in the middle because she is um, a colleague of mine and uh, she got a PhD last year. Okay. We tend to think, whoops, um, we may think that all our students are a particular kind of person except for the ones who work, who care for others, who struggle to stay on course, who are poor, who have children, and so on and so forth. But of course, you know, the standard student, the imagined student, the 18 to 21 year old who has no commitments and can have a good time, is the red body, not the grey body, in my view. Um, the problem we have is that policy is made for the red body and not the grey bodies. The way we run our organisation is for the red body and not the grey bodies. So let's talk about my stories. There are three stories about the challenges I think we have in organisations. And the first one is sometimes we hold the wrong mirrors up for ourselves. This is a personal story. I was coming to um, UWC and I said I really wanted to take something about my school with me. And I commissioned a colleague in my school to produce, a, 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 I brought them here, a leaflet about my school, just saying something about each of the departments. And I said it would be great if we could have some statistics on the back. So there are some statistics on the back. And uh, when I got here, I looked at the statistics and I thought there's something really wrong with these, really, really wrong with these. So I went back to the document from which the statistics come. And what's really wrong with these statistics, let me show you, is this. Okay? And what's wrong with that is it suggests we have no students over 40. We have... 22% uh, of our students are over, 30, over 40, and um, I'll show you a slide in a minute, but our older student, and then here's the interactivity. How old is our older student? 93. No, come on. <laughs> Sorry? No, 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 higher than 93. 96. Okay. And the reason we know is that she was in the student centre, and she was having trouble with the computer, and the um, guy, you know, the attendant said, the person on the desk said to her, oh, let me help you. And she said, I know how to use a, young, a computer, young man, she said, but it won't accept my birth date. Okay? <laughs> so here's actually who we are. So in terms of age, you'll see 13% of our students are uh, over 40, 6% over 50, 3% over um, 60. So that means that 22% of our students were omitted from that slide. What kind of a mirror are we holding up to ourselves? Something about gender, just to give you an idea about the organization. Um, so many more women than men. Like you, I think, yeah. yes? Ethnicity. Um, so 41% of our students are, in our language, black or minority ethnic. Um, disability, we have a lot of disabled students who are defined as disabled, but let me make it clear, in the UK, that includes issues um, to do with reading and writing, so dyslexia particularly, and I think that's one reason we have quite a high proportion of students who feed 25% disabled, which seems very high. It's much higher than other universities. But I think often dyslexic students 
are the very people who come to university later in their lives. Okay, now, just so you get a full picture of the institution, <coughs> Birkbeck is a research-intensive university. Um, one of the things that really I find very difficult is this uh, discrepancy between, um, no, there's a discourse which says you either do research or you attend to students. I think you have great research ambitions at UWC. These things are not incompatible. They stand together. But you have to want to make them stand together. And again, I, you know, I would say that we work hard at Birkbeck to have these two things work together, um, research and our commitment to teaching and working with the kinds of students that we work with. So I'm really proud because my school has sociology, philosophy, politics and history in it. And we're up there with the best of them in the country. Okay, second story, what I've called following the pack. I think, again, we shouldn't forget that everything externally assumes that students are the red person on that table. And everything assumes that students have lives which mean that they are going to study for a period as a full-timer and then go on to part-time study, uh, then go on to, to a working life. And in the UK, this is exemplified also by the idea of student choice, that student choice has to do with making rational decisions on the basis of a number of criteria. So now we have a kind of shop. Um, you, know, uh, you know when you're going online and you want to get some idea of comparative prices and you can put fridges next to each other on comparison sites so you can see what their features are and so on. But we have the same for universities. But what's really interesting are the features that are compared. Now I don't know if you can see this, but one of the features that's compared is the time that you will spend in lectures, seminars and similar. And we are having a debate in the institution at the moment because on the left is my old university, the University of Leeds. On the right is Birkbeck. And this is a geography degree. And the debate is in geography. And the debate we're having, the head of geography is saying, we don't look good because it looks like we're shortchanging our students. Right? And my argument is, why does it matter? This is not about shortchanging our students. This is actually about responding to who our students are and our understanding of what their engagement in study is. And so we have to take up the challenge about this kind of comparison rather than what the, our tendency is to want to be able to compete and to be able to say we're as good as everybody else. So there's a political campaign to change this rather than to say, well, we as an institution need to rush to be as comparable as any other institution. So I think, again, these are real arguments. And the image I have of the organization, when I think about these, this data, the KISS data, the key information set data, is this. You know, I really, really feel that we're being kind of put in a straitjacket. Don't fit. Just going to get in the jacket. And I think that's a challenge for a university like UWC. I think it's a challenge, and that's why that historical message is so critical. But this image is often, often in my head as we have these arguments and battles. The third story, and I'm nearly finished, um, is a story about what I would call resistance and reinvention. And I want to talk about a problem that you will have that we have. I use the word problem with inverted commas. Because we work with students with complex lives, with things that happen to them, and awful, awful things happen to our students. Really bad. Um, things that come into their lives that make it impossible for them to continue studying at that point. Right? So when we look at, hum at completion rates and so on, you know, it's often people will head, hold their heads in their hands, but if we look at completion rates over a number of years, what we find is people come back. 
But what's interesting is that when people say to us, look, I want to defer, which is the language that we use, in other words, to stop out for a bit, I think stop out is the language you use, um, we make it very easy for them. All they have to do is ask, and then an administrator signs it off, that's it, then they've stopped out, or they've, they, they've deferred. But what happens to them? Do we have any connection with them? Do we have any relationship with them? What do we do? It's up to the individual member of staff, it's up to the individual course leader, up to the individual administrator to keep contact with those students. How do our systems support those students? Well, the deans were talking about this together last year. We have five deans and we go and get away for two days each year and we worry together. And we came up with the idea of, instead of thinking about these as deferrals or stopouts or any other language, to start to develop a system of student sabbatical, to turn these into periods, creative periods of learning, in which we retained a relationship, a loose relationship with our students. Um, and to do that systemically, rather than leaving it up to individuals to think bit by bit by bit. So I think that in this discussion about flexibility, sometimes what we have to do is turn it on its head. We have to change the way in which we think about what is a problem to thinking about it as a creative opportunity. And you're going to hear some fantastic examples of this from the case studies, I think. Okay, on to the last section. And I guess this is back to what Shirley was talking about earlier on. You know, when we talk about flexibility, often what comes to mind is a discourse which is about, you know, well, we need to respond to student needs, we need to facilitate learner engagement, we need to meet learner expectations of being able to use technologies, um, we need to attract students to our university because we're competing with other universities, so we need to make it as attractive as possible. So it's a kind of idea of student choice. I think that's the predominant discourse around flexibility. And so, um, solutions are student module choice or online learning or um, in my university we video lectures and then put them online so we use a system called sometimes called lecture capture and sometimes called panoptico for those of you uh, with social science backgrounds you might uh, like the word panoptico it's reminding us of the panopticon um, we, we talk about this language of part-time, full-time students. We make big divisions, as Shirley's saying, between the two. Day, evening, again, we make big divisions between them. That's one way of thinking about flexibility. Okay. But the, another way is to really ask ourselves, who are our students as, and this is something I talked about a couple of days ago, persons in the world, what, who are our students? I asked, how many of your students work? And as an institution, you don't know. And I understand why you don't know, because they're not supposed to be working if they're here full time. But how many of them do work? It would be very interesting to know the, the real um, answer to that. And we should ask ourselves, why? Why are we doing this? And I, I believe that it is to do with your deep engagement um, in your mission of educating the most socially disadvantaged. That's what flexibility is about. Understanding what it means to be socially disadvantaged and what that means for your education. And I think we should ask ourselves also why, in terms of thinking of flexibility, why is it so difficult for organizations to accommodate students? Why is it so difficult for us? You know, what are those, if you like, straitjackets that we put around ourselves? What mirrors are we holding up to ourselves about who we think our students are? Who do we want our students to be? I think that's a question that we need to be asking constantly. And who are we as educators in relation to those students? Okay, so what and the how, this is my last slide. Um, I think that we're going to hear a lot more about that. But for me, it means all sorts of things in thinking about flexibility. It means full engagement. In my institution, the people, we have people called attendants who basically are at the front of each building. And the attendants are people who themselves are often scholars with at Birkbeck. So they themselves understand something about 
what it means to study in the institution. I can see Rita waving her arm, she's going to stop me. Um, Organisational change, I think, means really very fundamental things. It means thinking about where students eat. It means thinking about, um, and I think you'll see some great examples in a bit, thinking about what happens when the, I, when the like last night, we had an outage where I am, right? No power. What was I going to do about my presentation? Um, so I sat up very late last night once the power came back on. What's the real, material realities of people's lives? I think it means organizational change in all kinds of ways. Some of our regulations are absolutely terrifying from the point of view of thinking about flexibility. How do we really fundamentally engage with that? Um, it means curriculum change, it means pedagogic tinkering, as uh, Tara Fenwick would say, and so on and so forth. And I think it means the kind of relational um, connection and debate and knowledge that both Shirley and Heidi were talking about. So, some personal stories, some history, um, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. And I'm five minutes late, I'm sorry.